Um, as you might have guessed from the title of this talk, uh, this is not a technical talk. Uh, this is really built around my own sort of personal experience and stories and things I've learnt at the pub talking to people. Um, and the focus is, is really for me, and, and, and my history has been on uh, startups and stuff I learnt working with startups, with venture capitalists, you know, with people and with product designers and that kind of stuff. Um, there is a technical session on downstairs in number one, uh, which is uh, paint all the code, which sounds pretty cool. Before I really get started, though, there's some guys I want to thank. Um, these guys here, this is the uh, British East India Company. Uh, these, are, these are some of my heroes. Full disclaimer, I don't actually know whether this is the British East India Company or not. This is the perils of using Google. Um, but these guys, they were based in India, and they had a few big, uh, few big enemies. You know, beyond anybody who could sail a boat, which was the Spanish and the Dutch and the Portuguese and the French, pretty much any country with boats, they had one really big enemy, and that is the mosquito. The mosquito carried malaria, uh, it infected a lot of people, a lot of people got sick, they couldn't do their jobs. But what they found is that the, uh, the mosquitoes were really put off by this particular plant. And this particular plant was something that they would grind up, they would, add, um, they would add sugar and water to be able to create something that tasted just downright bloody horrible, but it did a really good job of keeping, keeping the mosquitoes away. Um, and that is the basis for tonic. So tonic, horrible tasting stuff, in order to make it taste good, what they did was they added gin. And that created the gin and tonic. They're actually getting rations of gin at the time. Uh, add a squeeze of lime, you know, ice and stir, creates a really, really nice drink. This happens to be my favourite cocktail, um, but it's also one of my favourite metaphors as well. Because in gin and tonic, the tonic really, really tastes horrible. Has anybody actually drunk just pure, straight tonic? Did anybody enjoy it? A couple of people. You, you did have malaria, yeah, it certainly helps with the malaria. And so it doesn't taste very good at all, but neither does gin particularly. And you don't go into a bar and people order, yeah, I'll have a neat gin, thanks very much. It's the combination between these two, these two substances that makes for a really, really great drink. Uh, and, and that's kind of the basis for what I'm going to talk about today. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is things that go wrong. When things go wrong and when we fail, that's kind of the tonic. That's actually the bit that's probably more beneficial to us than the gin. And the gin's beneficial in its own way. But the tonic is the, is the real medicine. And a full disclaimer, before you go and start drinking a shitload of, uh, of tonic in order to get rid of the malaria, it's not particularly effective at it. It was thought to be effective, but it really isn't. You would need to drink um, several litres of tonic every 12 hours, which, you know, you'd be pretty much hammered all the time if you were to do this. So I don't recommend that. So big warning, you know, hashtag warning, we're obviously still in objective sea land here. Opinions ahead. So what I'm going to give you is, uh, is my opinion and my views, which has kind of been formed from, uh, from varying degrees of, you know, education and some experiences, particularly experience with startups and at the pub, right? So this is a, this is a, a drinking-based talk. Um, a lot of what I've learned is, has been spent from actually talking to people, people who've been involved in startups, I spent six years in Silicon Valley, um, just chatting to people and, and doing stuff and working with people. Um, there's plenty of the information I'm going to give you is very, very opinion based, meaning that you can find any number of opinions on the internet that both agree and disagree with what I've got to say. So take everything um, for, for, for what it's worth, really. It's not going to be all about the successes. Um, it's going to be a lot about the failures as well. Uh, but before I start things, and, and you know, this is kind of a, a warning that you shouldn't really accept opinions of people you don't know or don't know anything about. So I'm going to give you a brief history of, of, of me, essentially, um, so that you can sort of say, well, I choose to believe this guy or not. So this is me. Um, if you can't tell, that's a photo of me. Uh, my Twitter handle, email address, so feel free to contact me after the talk. Probably the thing that, uh, that I'm most well known for is that right now I work for Evernote. Um, so I write the, uh, work on the Mac OS X team at Evernote. Um, there's really about six of us. I do mostly the UI stuff. Uh, I've been coding for the Mac since the original release of Xcode. The way I came to be working at Evernote is that I worked on Sketch. So a couple of friends of mine and I, 
Um, made Skitch and sold it to Evernote in 2011. Um, before that, though, going right the way back, particularly relevant to the AUC, is that I attended the University of Adelaide. I studied computer systems engineering, and I absolutely sucked at it. I was really, really terrible at, uh, at this particular period. I left having achieved basically nothing. I think it took me three years to get through a year and a bit of, of computer systems engineering back in the 90s. There's a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into those right now. I didn't end up going back to university. I went back in 2003 part-time and studied for a Bachelor of Business in Management of Information Technology. So basically my view and my, my kind of bias is really that intersection between business and engineering. Um, I work fundamentally as an engineer, but my qualifications are fundamentally in business. So 2004, I was actually in Melbourne. My first startup that I went to was out here in Baronia. It's a horrible drive out there, not particularly interesting. I apologise if any of you are from Baronia. Um, but eventually, you know, those guys ran out of money. But luckily, uh, around that time, because I was studying, Thankfully, I got a trip to WWDC 2006 from the AUC. So this was back in the good old days when the, uh, when the Apple University Consortium used to give you a scholarship to, to go to WWDC. It was awesome. Really, really enjoyed it. Came back. The company I was working for went broke. I moved up to Brisbane. Uh, I was working for Novamind. Has anyone heard of Novamind? It's a mind mapping software, actually the original mind mapping software for Mac OS X. So I worked on that for a few years. I went back to WWDC 2008, again on the AUC's dime. Again, awesome. I have a huge amount of respect and a huge amount of thanks for the AUC. While I was there, I was having lunch, as you do, talking to some guys. They said, oh, you're a Mac OS X guy? I said, yes. They said, will you come and work for us? And I sort of thought, OK, well, let's have a little bit of a chat about this more. So I went down to San Jose from WWDC. Um, sat in a room full of guys who were all ex-Apple engineers, so guys who wrote the uh, Apple Share IP stack in System 7. And I thought, this is awesome. Obviously, this is going to be a great company. So I went and worked for them. Um, and that was, that was uh, my first sort of period there was around about two years. Uh, the company eventually kind of hit some very, very rough times, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, they transitioned me into... Um, into more product management roles. So again, having that, having that business background, I, I, I spent a few years as a product manager. Uh, we did a whole heap of stuff for Sony, so a lot of the stuff that, uh, that you see in, in, in Sony's online services, um, the good parts of Sony's online services, not the part where we lose you know, a few hundred million credit cards. Uh, we try and tend to avoid that. Uh, but the personal, the personal um, image and video sharing part of Sony, so that was built by the team that I, that I work with. Um, and as I said today, I am, uh, I am back at Evernote, working from Sydney, which is a, it's kind of a nice gig. Um, so again, my bias is very much on that intersection between business and engineering, and that's what a lot of the lessons and things that I've learned, and I'm going to share a lot of those lessons with you. Basically, this is going to be a brain dump of all the things that didn't work for me, um, some of the things that did work for me over the last kind of six years. The metaphor for this, though, is... Um, Probably the margarita. The margarita has uh, three main ingredients, one of which obviously is tequila. Um, there's lime or lemons and lime, uh, there's triple sec, and there's some salt. Now, what I would say is that the lessons that, that I've learned the most about, the areas that I've kind of paid most attention to, are really in these three areas, um, which is people, basically the team that you're working with, the product that you're working on, um, the investment side, and also, like a good margarita, you should take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt. So on people, I'm going to get right into this, on people, why is people important? If I've got the best idea for a product, surely isn't that enough? Absolutely not. Um, at Pixar, and uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to meet a few people from there, they're all really tremendous people, um, they kind of have this saying that you can take a great script and you can give it to an average team. What do you think you'll get? Something pretty ordinary. A great team is able to execute a lot better. So if you take an average script and give it to a great team, what do you think you get? Something pretty damn good. So the measure of success, most likely, you know, when we look at success and we look at what makes a successful product, it's often in the team that we're working with and the approach, not the actual core concept itself. A great example of this in the software land is this delicious library. Delicious library is kind of a pivotal point, I think, in, uh, in Mac OS X software. It was, it was when, um, I think it was like 2006 or 2000, no, earlier in that, 2005, 2004, when it launched. 
Um, it takes a horribly boring premise, which is managing my personal library of DVDs and CDs uh, and who I lend them to and makes that into a really, really beautiful software title. So it really is all in the execution because, again, the premise behind this is terribly boring. But when you wrap it up and you give it a great interface, what you end up with is people interacting with your software a lot more. Um, but it's not so much, hey, look, I've created this great user experience. The great user experience really comes from having a great team and, and, and having come, come from really having um, the right focus within that team as well. So, question, how do you get a great team? Right. This, is, this is kind of a difficult part. The first rule that, that I've learned, and I learned this from a guy who explained this to me in a pub once, and I went, yeah, actually, that, that makes a lot of sense, is there's two axes by which you, can, which you can plot people on when you first interview them. And when you're interviewing them, um, these, are, these are really great things to look out for. And again, I'm sort of a bit of a business man, so funnily enough, again, it's a two axes graph. Um, one of those axes is smart. How smart are they? And the second axis is how much they give a shit. Again, where you want to be is you want to be up and to the right, unsurprisingly. Again, business chart. So if somebody's smart and they give a shit, chances are they're going to find somewhere in your organization to work and work really effectively. On the other hand, if they're not smart, they don't give a shit, they have absolutely no place whatsoever. But what about the people who fall into the other two categories? The people who are really smart, but don't give a shit. How effective are they? Pretty ineffective. And, and you find these people in teams, they're really, really super smart guys. They actually don't give a shit about the thing that they're building. They don't give a shit about the company. So when you're interviewing people, try and figure out, look, what is it that they're doing here? Why are we interviewing this person? They could be super smart, and it's easy to employ somebody who on paper is super smart, but in reality isn't really a great fit for your company because they don't really care. The other one is people who are really, really, really care, really, really enthusiastic, but aren't that smart. And I don't mean that they you know, have a low IQ, they're just not necessarily smart for your team at the time. Um, these people can be very dangerous because uh, they sort of come in and, and they don't necessarily have the experience or know how to do things, but they really, really care and they're really, really engaged. It can be quite damaging. I added a third line to this because I'm not a very good business person. Business people tend to keep it to two things that they can plot on a chart. Uh, I added a third metric, which was, do you want to work with them? So if somebody comes in and, and you're interviewing them or you know, you're looking at candidates or you, the reverse might be true, um, where you're actually interviewing. Uh, the three things you want to get right are, are they smart? Like, is this an organization of smart people that really care what they're doing? And do you want to work there? Because you can be really smart, you can be really engaged and really care, um, but if it's not really a cultural fit, then basically, you know, it, it's not going to work out well. So that's, that's a good lesson for employing new people. But even when you've done all that and you've done your homework, sometimes things don't work out very well. Uh, sometimes you've hired somebody, you've got people on the team, or perhaps you didn't apply these filters when you, when you employed people or, or when you started to work with people. Um, and, and here's a, another great rule that I've learned that, that has, has steered me well on several occasions, and that's to imagine each member of your team coming to you with their resignation. Right? So picture it, go through it, go through everyone that you work with, They've come to you and they've said, I'm resigning. Question, are you bummed about it? If you are not bummed about it, go and fire them now. Or get creative and have their firing orchestrated. Um, this will help you get rid of dead weight and keep your team really, really lean. These are going to be the people who when you first need to downsize, and you will need to downsize, or sorry, I'm going to use the appropriate term here, pivot. Um, so when you're starting to run out of money, uh, you'll find that people who kind of fall into this category, that you're not really bummed about them if they left, um, they probably don't have a great part in your organization anyway. So why wait until your company's in trouble? Like why wait until you've run out of money to go and trim the fat? So always keep lean, keep trimming the fat, and you'll be less likely to get into trouble in the first place. Another rule um, is, 
as few people as possible. But no fewer. This obviously comes from the um, uh, the Einstein quote, as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, except I really go against that. As few people as possible, sometimes fewer. The reason for this is that more people means more opinions. Um, often more people doesn't mean getting there faster either. Uh, if you can have a team that's really focused, focus kind of takes fewer people. The more people you've got, the less focused you'll be. It's kind of a fundamental rule. Uh, and the wrong people will kind of set you back. But you, as I said, adding resources off, you know, often won't make you any faster. It won't make you, it certainly won't make you any more efficient. And there's a rule that um, nine women can't make a baby in one month. So adding more and more resources often diversifies and says, okay, all this stuff, all this time I'm spending interfacing with other people is time that I can sort of spend on my core task. And as an engineer, this is often the case, you'll be asked, okay, well, should we get you some help? Um, and often that help won't really be a help. It will take you a while to get ramped up with that other person. It will take you a while for them to, to really come in and be productive. And often what you need is, well, instead, let's just get rid of the other stuff that I'm doing. Uh, let's keep this team small and keep lean, keep moving ahead. Some actual evidence of that, though, and there was some commentary about this um, last week or the week before. It might have been on the Loop Insight or something. Uh, preview. The preview app in Mac OS X. You got any guesses of how many people write the preview app in Mac OS X? One. one. Precisely one person. Another point of reference is that uh, I was actually interviewing at Apple um, a few years ago, and I talked to a guy. He walks into the room. He says, hey, I'm such and such. Um, I'm the printer guy. I said, what do you mean you're the printer guy? He said, I, I do the printing stuff. Okay. I thought, surely there's a team for that. He said, nope, it's just me. So pretty much everything, I mean, Mac OS X printing is built off of the back of, of you know, BSD printing. Um, but all the, you know, they have to wrap it up and they have to do some fancy stuff with it. Uh, but this guy is ludicrously, ludicrously smart, been there since the next days, you know, obviously been at Apple for a really long time, understands this stuff inside and out. Um, he is the printer guy. Sketch, so originally Sketch was, uh, was a couple of guys working and then uh, Sketch um, split off from Plask back in 2008. Uh, I was pretty much the, the, the one engineer on Sketch from then through to when we released it. Um, and for me, Sketch was a hobby. Sketch was actually something I wrote in my, uh, well, I worked on, you know, in my spare time. Um, so I spent a few years doing that. Um, oddly enough, though, two designers, um, actually those designers keynote at DevWorld a few years ago, uh, Keith Lang and Chris Pearson, really, really smart guys. On from that, frameworks. So frameworks in, in Mac OS X and iOS, does anyone know what, what the average number of people is on like a framework at Apple? So big things that people use, you know, the foundation building blocks for, um, for Mac OS X and iOS? Yeah, four to six. So pretty much bang on a handful. Um, and that kind, of, that kind of leads me to one of the things that, that helps us to get around this and helps us to, to keep, that, um, keep that team, that, that, that emphasis, you know, it enable you to continue to be lean and continue to use small teams, is that in some respects, the architecture of Mac OS X and iOS is more built around the teams rather than um, the other way around. So, you know, when you find that your, your framework is getting too damn big, or this, this one module is getting too damn big, uh, you need to break it apart in order to keep moving forward at a really rapid rate. Like if we took the entire underpinnings of Mac OS X and just smashed it into, uh, into one big framework, um, that wouldn't be a great idea because you know, all of a sudden you've got everybody kind of you know, in this monolithic structure. Only two more examples of this and why this works. Instagram. Instagram was acquired for however many billions of dollars. Anyone know what the headcount there was? 13, so pretty close. 13 guys all shared. I think the average it was like the highest uh, amount of money paid per employee for a company. It was about 75 million per employee. And Evernote, we actually have a saying at Evernote, which is never more people on a team than you would have over for dinner. Right? So, you know, if, if you're having a big party, there's a lot of chaos and confusion and things going on. If you're having a dinner party, it's much more structured. You can have a conversation, you can have a theme, people can weigh in, you can talk to each other individually, but the rule is never more people on a team than you would have over, have over for dinner. Um, 
Another one, again, this is just a huge brain dump, so I apologize for, for sort of switching between things here. Making decisions is really key. Uh, you're better off making the wrong decision than making no decision at all. If you're not making decisions, you're not moving forward. If you're making the wrong decisions, you might be moving forward, you might be moving forward in the right way, um, but it's still better than making no decisions at all because you're still learning. Failure is fundamentally learning. If you're not doing this, you end up with some degree of analysis paralysis, meaning you're sitting there wondering whether it's the right thing to do or not instead of exploring it and figuring out whether it is the right thing or not. So you end up making decisions based off of opinions, you know, individual opinions. What you're better off doing is trying it and seeing and, uh, and making mistakes. And just about every product that I've worked on um, has suffered uh, this to a certain degree. A big one um, that I had was, was when I was working for Memeo, which is a company that went over to the US to work for. Um, got to the point where the biggest problems that we had were internal. And, and at that point, the, here's, here's a rule for you. If you find that the biggest issues you have is yourself and the people within your company, that's a pretty good indication that things aren't going very well and something needs to change. Um, you also need to make sure you've got the right kinds of conflict in that, because you can have sort of constructive conflict where people are challenging each other, and you can have destructive conflict where people are, are really shutting each other down. Um, and what I, to, to, what I found that really helps to mitigate this is to really understand fundamentally the team that you're working with. Um, and, and a big rule here is to understand your people and, and what motivates them. Uh, and that's really important. So anybody you're working with, even if it's your boss or the CEO, particularly if it's the CEO, it helps to understand what is their motivation. Why do they get up and come to work in the morning? So why is this? Because you're going to figure out by knowing what it is that motivates them, you're going to know what their biases are. You're going to know what it is that they're more likely to say or, or you know, the direction that they're heading in mightn't be neutral. In fact, no one really heads in a neutral direction. What we rely on a team is people pulling each other in different directions and having the balance. So, you know, knowing, knowing what motivates them and why they get out of bed also helps to, us to figure out why they're most likely to fail. And in the CEO scenario, it's, uh, it's really important because often their bias is why, the, why maybe the company will fail. So a great example, I think there's really four kinds of people that I've met. They fall into, everyone falls into uh, um, either purely into one of these categories or a cross-section of these categories. Um, the tech heads, like Steve Wozniak, pure product guy, pure technology guy. The reason he got out of bed in the morning was technology, was to push that forward and make bigger and better, better things using less resources. It was really, really amazing at it. But where is he likely to fail? So where are the tech guys, the guys who are you know, all about the stack, all about the technology, where are they likely to fail? Well, I mean, they're likely to fail because they invest too much into technology and not enough into understanding the business. So um, they're also less likely to ship. The saying back in the Mac days was, um, what was it, good artists copy, great artists steal, and then the other one was uh, real artists ship. So all about shipping a product. Tech guys who are sort of fundamentally driven entirely by tech are less likely to ship. The money guys. There's certainly a lot of these in Silicon Valley now. Um, on any corner, you'll meet people who are motivated purely by their wallets. They come there to work, and they come there to, to try and make the next you know, multi-million dollar app idea and make a bunch of money and leave. Um, that's their motivation. And they can be helpful too. They will help you to ship. But do you really want them involved in product? Probably not. Yeah, they're helpful in some areas, and again, they're helpful in, in balancing a team, but one that's sort of, um, you know, working for a CEO who's all about, you know, their entire focus is, I'm going to make the next big app, I want to ship the next big app and make a bunch of money really quickly, that mightn't be the most satisfying job for you. Um, as an example, this is a real email I received from a guy, somewhat redacted, but uh, he said, Brad, and again, I've changed the name, Brad said I should email you about an idea. I only want 10% of the revenue generated from set app. Now, it should be pointed out that this guy was not an engineer. He was not a product guy. He's just a guy who had an idea. And he thought, you know what? I just, I, I'm just going to give these guys my idea, and then I'm going to take 10% of the money. That was genuinely his view on life. And it's uh, ended with, you're welcome, world. <laughs> Maybe one of the douchiest emails I've ever read in my life. But needless to say, I did not respond to that one. 
two more categories of people. Uh, the guys who are there for the paycheck. So the guys who are there to, you know, have got a mortgage, a bunch of kids maybe, or they really don't care, they're not that, they're not that interested in, in the technology or interested in the big money. What they want to do is they want to um, earn a paycheck. And, you know, the valley and tech industry is not a bad place to earn a paycheck. And those people can be useful. And the way to motivate those people um, is to sort of say, well, you know, if we don't do this, the company is going to probably tank. And that will get them into a panic, um, saying, if we don't do this, the product sucks. That's probably not going to bother them too much. You know, as long as I keep getting my paycheck. And the last one um, is the, uh, the egomaniac. Um, so the egomaniac, and we see this actually a lot in tech companies, what they're driven by is that you know, the reason they get out of bed in the morning uh, is so that people will revere them. You know, so that people will, will respect them and say, oh, this, this person's awesome and they've done these great things. Uh, it's reasonably common for CEOs. Does anyone know who this is? Jack Dorsey. Uh, there's a great ad. Who said the Twitter guy? Really interesting. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. There's a saying that Jack Dorsey's best product is Jack Dorsey. Um, there's a lot of... I'll get to this in a minute, but Nick Bilton, who's a, who's a reporter for, I think, New York Times, wrote a whole book on, on hatching Twitter. Um, there's a bunch of guys who lay claim to, you know, having invented Twitter. Um, Dick Costello, Ev Williams, uh, Jack Dorsey, they're all people who have been in there for various parts. And this book really looks at um, the interactions between those guys, between other people, like product people, who are actually responsible for building this stuff. Uh, and it gives kind of a more realistic view of how a Silicon Valley company, a big Silicon Valley company, and one that ultimately IPOs, it gives a view on how that stuff actually happens. You know, the interactions with the board, the interactions with the investors, needless to say, it's not linear. So, again, you know, the four, the four types of people that I've met, uh, the technology people, the people driven by tech, the people are driven by big, big money, people are driven by paychecks, and the people are driven by, you know, respect, essentially the egomaniacs. Um, it is really important to understand the people you're working with and what motivates them. That'll help you to get the most out of your team and to understand where you as a team are most likely to fail. If everyone's pulling in one of these directions too hard, it's most likely going to be the failure point. So again, the book by Nick Bilton is, uh, is hatching Twitter. The last one um, is self-criticality uh, versus self-reassuring people. Um, you know, what I've learned is that self-critical people, self, people who are self-critical are constantly measuring themselves by themselves. They're looking at ways to make themselves better. Uh, they're much harder on themselves than you will be on them. So somebody who's self-reassuring is the opposite of that. They're much more defensive. You know, if you try and give any kind of critique, it's like, no, no, I did that right. So who would you rather work with, the self-critical people or the self-reassuring people? So again, choose your team carefully. I'm going to wind up the, the, the part on people because I'm probably running reasonably low on time here. Um, so you understand your team, understand who you're working with, understand what you need. Uh, and the metaphor here is really um, the Bloody Mary. You know, oftentimes uh, what goes into a Bloody Mary is, is what you can find. Uh, it's, you know, I got up in the morning, I'm going to throw what I can, whatever I can find into a drink and try and, you know, make something that's good out of that. Um, try and have a little more structure than that, though. Don't just, don't just build your team out of things you've had lying around the place. Um, but I'll finish on, uh, you know, the people section on what, what I've found really helps. Um, get out of the boardroom. Get out of the office. Take people out. Go out and have a drink with them or do something social with them. They're much more likely to tell you what they really think. What they really think is really, really important. All right. So lessons on product. Who's got an idea for a product? Excellent. Do you want me to tell you what it's worth? <laughs> nothing. It's worth nothing. And there's an expression, there are many deviations on this, uh, on this expression, but ideas are like assholes. Everyone's got one and they all stink. Right? So an idea is a great thing to have. It's not so great if you can't, if you can't execute on it. Um, but there's a lot of ideas, a lot of, lot of companies I've seen kind of fail. They have an idea, they're going to pitch their idea, maybe they get some funding, maybe they put their life savings into it without really thinking through what's going to turn this idea into being something successful. And this isn't just a rule for startups, this is something that big companies are challenged by as well. And the first thing is, I've got an idea, it's possible. And for us, often as engineers, 
what we're focused on, is it possible? Can I do this thing? And we think, I can do this thing and therefore I will. Um, not necessarily the greatest approach. One of the things you might want to think about there, not only is it possible, but is it viable? The difference between possibility and viability is one is can I build it, one is can I build it uh, for the right price. Now, the fortunate part is this is constantly changing for us. If we look at anything that we wanted to build today, what's viable today is, is there's a far um, lower bar for viability. What, you know, what it costs us to build a product now is completely different to what it costs us to build a product a few years ago. You know, services like PASS, like where I don't have to go and build a cloud or I don't have to go and build SDKs, um, the, the, the bar for, for viable is changing constantly. It's coming down constantly. So it helps to, even though we might have had an idea and we might have shelved an idea a while ago, the, the viability piece can change often, so it helps to revisit that. The second thing is, all right, so you've got an idea, you think it's possible, you've proved it's possible, you've done the tech part, you think it's viable. Um, the next assumption that, that, that probably trips a lot of people up is that they think that if they build it, if you build it, they will come. Uh, that's not enough. Has anyone ever seen this reference, Field of Dreams? Um, having the product and putting it out there in the market, you've really got to know that you've really got to have an avenue for people to buy your product. And I don't mean just putting it in the store and being able to take a payment from people. That's no longer enough. There was this brief period in time where that was enough and we thought we can just publish stuff and we'll get users. Um, that's really not the case. You need to have marketing people. You need to sort of understand how you're going to get your product out. Um, you need to understand you know, what's going to make customers actually come to you. And the last one is, even if they come to you, are they going to pay you money? Really, really critical piece here that a lot of people actually forget when you're, you're assessing an idea. What has changed really dramatically in the last few years is what people are willing to pay for. That bar has gone really low. There's been definitely a race to the bottom here of what people are willing to pay for, or more, more particularly, what they expect for free. People's expectations of what they can get for free now um, <laughs> is a lot. So let's look at our funnel. We're going to take some ideas. Are they possible? Is it feasible? Can I get customers? And even if I can get those customers, will they make me payments? Right? So this is kind of, you know, it's a, it's a crash course in, in things that I've seen go wrong. Any number of companies fail because they, uh, they just haven't been able to convert. They might even have a lot of customers. So they may have done all this right, but when it comes time to actually ask them to pay money and to really give you dollars and cents, uh, it just doesn't happen. So you've got to figure out whether people are willing to pay for it. And out of that, you'll have ideas that don't suck. Or more specifically, ideas that suck less. Um, so again, I've said that this, this kind of applies to the bigger companies as well. Great example is the Sony Bravia. Uh, Sony, back in the CRT days, they made billions of dollars. You know, it was dollars for everybody. Because uh, they made the greatest CRT. When they went to flat screens, those profits dried up. In fact, Sony has never made any money on flat screens, as far as I'm aware. Um, and you know, they kind of don't publish these numbers, but from what I've heard, they don't make anything. And they didn't make anything. Not only were they not making anything, they were losing money on everything sold. So I think that they've lost in the, in the sort of vicinity of billions and billions of dollars since switching to flat screen. So great technology, great stuff, they just weren't making any money. So the, the, the way that Sony basically decided to reduce their losses a few years ago on the Bravias was to reduce the amount that they made. So, again, you've got to have a pro positive product margin on, on this stuff. So, uh, and, and that's got to do more with margin um, than, than it has to do with volume. You, you've got customers who are willing to pay, but you're actually not making any money, you're losing money on every product. So, products that suck versus products that don't. Um, this is obviously a pretty handy slide. Google Glass, pretty big failure. Uh, not necessarily a product that sucks, but it's not a successful product at all either. And I think that, you know, if I could say one thing about the, the comparison between these strategies, and if you look at this through one filter, I mean, there's plenty of ways to look at, look at and compare Google Glass to the iPad, but if you look at it through one single filter, I would say that filter is, who were these products built for? 
So you're going out and making a product. Who is the customer? Who is Sergey Brin's customer for the Google Glass? Sergey Brin, probably, and a bunch of engineers at Google. The iPad? Who is the customer? Well, I would say, um, yeah, everyone. Um, you know, my grandmother uses an iPad. She's 88. Right? Now, when these products were released, one of these products got great reviews by the tech press. One of these products got horrible reviews by the tech press. But fundamentally, knowing and, and really knowing your customer well and building something for that particular customer, not necessarily for you, is a, is a, is a pretty good rule to live by. So I've talked a lot about the stuff that didn't work. I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff that did, product strategies that did work. Um, the first one is Novamind. Novamind, again, mind mapping up in, uh, up in Brisbane. Um, it's kind of the opposite of what we see a lot of people try and do uh, in the tech field. It's low volume, high margin software. A lot of the, the emphasis and a lot of the push that we get is how many of these can you sell, right? So you push to, to, to do as high a volume as possible and therefore reduce your price as low as possible. Novamind, Novamind runs a really great business um, producing high margin software, um, low volume software. So that, that's a, they're good opportunities to look at. Another one, necessity is the mother of invention. Sketch is a really great example here. So Sketch were kind of, um, it came out of Plask. Plask was a group of guys who worked all over the world. No one was even in the same time zone, let alone the same room. Uh, and so what they needed was, was something where they could really capture, um, capture images from the desktop, annotate them and share them really quickly. So that became a product. It became a product from having built other things. So they knew the pain points were there. Test flight is another good example. Um, Some other guys at test flight really well. The history of test flight is kind of an interesting one where uh, um, you know, Oprah did her big iPad thing. These guys came from a company called 23 Divide. Uh, Test Flight came out of this company called 23 Divide. They were making software for, um, um, for media companies, and one of them was Oprah. It got to the point where they were trying to explain to Oprah's people how to install you know, test builds on an iPad. They had to literally put somebody in a plane and send them to Chicago to have the software installed on the iPad and they basically got back on the plane the same day and came home again. They thought there has to be a better damn way than this. Uh, so that, that was a huge frustration for them. Another area to look at, again, coming down to building stuff for the world around you and not you, Instagram. Legend has it that the Instagram founder, I forget the guy's name, was walking down the beach with his, uh, uh, with his girlfriend or his wife and said, why don't you post photos? And she says something like, uh, because you know, some of my friends post photos and mine don't look very good. He said, what do you mean they don't look very good? This is, this is the tech filter going on here. Uh, she said, well, here, look, his, his look way better than mine. He said, well, that's stupid. All he's done is put a filter on it. And then he went, holy shit, all I've done is put a filter on it. Right? And, and a huge opportunity there. Um, so talk to the people around you and, and try and understand their needs as well. The tech world is very well catered to, frankly. Uh, we build stuff for ourselves a lot. We don't necessarily build stuff for grandma. So how do we test these premises? The, um, uh, one of the big, big ones that's worked out really well here is Dropbox. Uh, so Dropbox, it, you know, they had a, kind of a premise for some software that they wanted to build. You know what they built instead? A video. They made a video of what they wanted their product to be and they put it on the internet and they said people come and sign up. And if not enough people signed up, they didn't build it. And that's what we're seeing in Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a way of testing your premise and testing what is your idea for software, being able to get out there and pitch it. Um, and if it works, you know, great, people come and buy it. Um, if they don't, don't build it. So don't build it and then expect that there will be customers. This is a great way to test it. Another thing that Amazon does is internally they write press releases before they build a product. So they'll write a press release for the product and they'll circulate that internally. If that doesn't excite people, don't build the damn thing. Right? Really, if, if you can't get people excited when you launch the product, don't build it. This actually comes from a book, one of the great books on this, the Bible on this, is Four Steps to the Epiphany, uh, which is about a guy's failures and sort of understanding this and how this works. Um, again, I'm going to 
don't have a lot of time left here, so on investors, um, I'll sort of give you another brain dump here. The ideal VC outcome when they fund your company is that they want you to either IPO, like in the case of Fitbit, or they want you to sell out to a big company, like in the case of Tesla. The backing rate, um, the failure rate for VC-backed companies is about 9 out of 10. There's no official numbers on this, but about 9 out of 10 VC-backed companies fail. It's a good joke. What's the best way to end up with a million dollars in Silicon Valley? Start with 10. And that's true. It'd be a lot funnier if it wasn't. Um, the VC ideal exit rate is actually less than 1 in 100. So, you know, the, the companies that they bank on, a few of them, you know, they, look, they might sell them off and they might get acquired, but they don't necessarily get acquired for the kinds of money that they're looking for. What this leaves, for those of you doing the math at home, is 9 out of 100. So the bunch of guys who kind of sit in the middle, uh, this is a really frustrating place for venture capitalists to have you. They either want you to fail and fail fast and stop using up their precious oxygen, or they want you to succeed and succeed fast. If you're kind of meandering along in the, in the middle, they don't care about you. you. In fact, you're a bigger frustration for them. Um, so as soon as that potential to make a lot of money, even though you might be profitable, being profitable isn't necessarily enough for the VC world. Great examples. Our sister companies, um, we were, you know, one of the companies I work with uh, was venture backed by Foundry Group, which is a really notable VC. They invested in Zynga, Zynga floated, they made a heap of money. They invested in Fitbit, Fitbit floated, they made a heap of money. So those were really interesting things. They're their ideal case scenario. We sort of had, you know, low profits slash negative profits sometimes, sometimes we made a bit of money, sometimes we didn't. And for them, we were just kind of using up their valuable oxygen. They had to have a board seat, uh, you know, they had to invest time into us. And over a period of time, that becomes what's called investor fatigue uh, when, you know, it's neither working nor not working. And that's kind of an area you find yourself in. So if you think you're working one of those companies that's making normal profits, um, VC backing mightn't be the way to go for you. It is, however, the fastest way to fail. Right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing because we have this mantra which is fail fast. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing, mainly because you know, it is your time and it's not your money. So while you're doing this, you're inevitably going to find another idea. Um, so if you do go through this venture backing thing, it, it's like being on speed. It's, it's on, you're on turbo there. Um, and then you know, it'll either work out really well or it won't. Uh, you're better off knowing that and investing a couple of years of your life than investing 10 years of your life. Right? So failing fast is probably a good thing. So here are the probable outcomes uh, when, you, when, you, when you go down the startup path. Most likely outcome is that you go broke. Harsh but fair. That is the most likely outcome. Second really likely outcome is that you break up with the founders. So you've been working with some people. Um, you, you want to take it different directions. You kind of figure out how one person has to exit this scenario or multiple people have to exit this scenario. If neither of those gets you, you might start making boring profits. Right? You're making a profit, but it's not particularly interesting. You're not making, you know, there's still an opportunity cost of doing this. Next one is you're making exciting profits, and that's where it starts to become interesting. You might get acquired and you might IPO. All right? But why do I mention all these things? Because when you wrote the contracts for what you're doing, you wrote them before you realized what of these was going to happen. The great thing about contracts is that they're, you know, a really notable thing about contracts is that they're not written for when things go well. They're generally written for when things go bad. So understand all the possible outcomes and, and write it in, have that expectation, have it part of your... Um, you know, your founding agreement uh, as to, in these scenarios, what are we going to go with? What's going to happen? What's going to protect me? And last of all, I'll end on this note. Um, you know, I've been thrilled. There's, there's been this terrific uh, documentary series um, about what it's like to be a founder in, in Silicon Valley. And that is, of course, Silicon Valley. A lot of people will say that this is fiction. It's not fiction. Um, it's based very, very strongly in real stories from that. You can't possibly make a lot of this shit up. Um, and it is really, really, really accurate. So looking at that, and particularly the way they deal with investors and venture capitalists, is a really, really uh, interesting place to look. All right. So I think I'm out of time.